Hey, Oak okay, Simmons, Ben has been here. Yes, I'm going to open like that every time. Second semester, third experiment, Greenyard Reaction. Let's get to it. The Greenyard Reaction. It's probably pronounced Grignard, but really most of us aren't that German. It's an amazing reaction because it transforms a strong electrophile with almost no electron density into a strong nucleophile with an amazing amount of electron density. Then we can take this newly created Grignard reagent, represented by RMGX, and use it to attack a wide variety of electrophiles to give us hundreds of different products, a lot of which goes into pharmaceuticals, one of which is tamoxifen. It's used to treat breast cancer by targeting estrogen receptors. The mechanism for the reaction you usually comes to you in three steps. First, we're going to actually make the Grignard reagent by combining our alkyl halide with magnesium. Then we're going to have the bond between the magnesium and the carbon attack our electrophile, in this case acetone. It's important to note that it's the carbon with its electron density that is actually doing the attack on the electrophilic carbonyl carbon. Finally, the newly created oxyanion is going to pick up a hydrogen from water and be protonated, thus giving you your tertiary alcohol. Our actual reaction today is between bromobutane, magnesium, and then acetone, finishing off with a hydrochloric acid protonation. It's important to note that if your Grignard reagent comes in contact with water before it forms the oxyanion, you're actually going to have a side reaction that's going to protonate well before when you want it to. Hence, Grignards are water sensitive. Because of that, we had to crush the magnesium last week, and then we stuck it in an oven so it'd boil off all the water. As an additional precaution, we'll be using a drying tube again. Remember, cotton ball, two to three fingers worth of calcium chloride, and then another cotton ball. Just like that. Once you're ready to set up your water-cooled reflux condenser, go get yourself some latex tubing. That's this light orange one and not this dark orange one, which is much thicker. This dark orange one is for vacuum. It's made out of rubber. This light orange one is made out of latex, and that's what we're going to be using for water carrying. When you're ready to assemble your apparatus, grab your round bottom with your magnesium and stir bar out of the white desiccator. Then come over and assemble it as such. Make sure for the water-cooled reflux condenser, the water is coming in from the bottom and out from the top. I like to use the clamp as a weight to hold the tube in the sink. Just make sure you don't clamp it all the way shut. Next, test your system to make sure it's not spraying water all over the place. This looks good. When you're measuring both the bromobutane and the acetone, be using this type of syringe. With this type of syringe, you want to make sure that you get the surface of the liquid to whatever you want to measure. For the bromobutane, that's 1.6. For the acetone, something else. So make sure you got that right. Also, notice that the syringe and the bottle will both be labeled. This one has MEHE1. This says MEHE1. The other bottle, MEHE2. When you're working with a stir bar, it works best if you put it in the middle. It wants to be in the middle. That's where the magnet is. So you got to make sure that you align it left, right, up, down, so that when it's spinning, it's in the middle. Otherwise, it's not going to spin properly. Look at this one when I push it out of form. It just wants to jump back. Back to the apparatus. First thing they add is the ether. Don't worry about those wires. Those are just to keep it dry. Next, we add the bromobutane with an additional amount of ether. Get it stirring. It might take a few minutes before it actually starts reacting. It will look like a bunch of bubbles coming out. You might have to stop the stirring just to see it. After a few more minutes, it's going to turn this dark gray color. And it's going to stop bubbling. This is when it's time to start heating. 15 minutes. While it's cooking, go grab yourself an ice bath. After it's done, loosen the back bolt, lift it up, take out the hot plate, and then lower it into the ice bath. As it chills, make your ether acetone mix. Make sure you're using the good acetone and not the bad, cheap acetone in the red cap. When it reaches the temperature of the ice, you can go ahead and put it on your stir plate again. Ideally, we keep it stirring while on the ice, but that's kind of difficult to do. We don't need the drying tube anymore. When we're adding the acetone solution, we want to do this slowly. Either tip it over really, really slowly in really small increments, or use a pipette. Either way, it might spray out, so keep checking the temperature of your round bottom. Done with the second part of the reaction when we move on to the third, the acidification. Put it into an ice bath just like before, and pour the acid down the reflux condenser in small increments just like before. Eventually, it's going to turn this nice whitish color, sometimes with a tinge of yellow. All three parts of the reaction done, it's time for isolation. When you're doing the extraction, you have to use a separatory fund. To hold that up, we're going to use a ring stand. Ring stands come in one of two fashions. When using the separatory fund, it's going to separate into two phases. The one on the bottom would be a little bit denser, and the one on the top would be less dense. So you gotta look up the density of your solvents. Today our organic solvent is diethyl ether, and our aqueous, obviously, water. Right here I have my separatory form. You notice I already have two phases. When I'm ready to mix it up, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab two fingers on either side of this bar, hold it tight with one hand so I can completely support it, and I'm gonna shake it like I'm making a martini. Once I'm ready, I'm gonna point it into the hood, and then open it up to let a little gas out. Here you can see me decanting the reaction solution into the separatory funnel. Notice I'm using a pipette to stop the stir bar from falling in. If your stir bar does fall into the separatory funnel, don't fret too much. All you have to do is come to the waste hood, and there is a magnet on a stick that will help you pull it out. Just like that. 
Rich your round bounds a little bit more ether, add it to the rest. Shake it around, let some gas out, shake it around, let some gas out. Eventually, you'll be done. But you'll notice that there's still a little bit of bubbling that's happening. Look at those bubbles. Let me get a little bit closer. Yeah, do you see those bubbles? What are those bubbles? You want to figure that out. What are those bubbles? Collect your organic layer in a flask. Add a little bit of potassium carbonate to dry it off. Swirl it around. Should come out nice and clear. Shiny even. This is a good stopping point if you're running out of time. You can just cork it and leave it in your drawer for the week. Otherwise, if you have at least 40 to 50 minutes left, you can go on to the next step. Decant your dried solution to an alumire flask, or personally, I prefer a beaker. Just make sure there's a boiling chip. Rinse it out. Combine the wash. Just make sure you're leaving all the carbonate behind. Now here's the easiest part to screw up. You think everything's evaporating fine until suddenly you see a wisp. That wisp is your compound. Our product is a liquid and has a low boiling point. So definitely do this in the sand bath and keep your temperature underneath the boiling point of your compound. Eventually you'll finish boiling and you'll end up with a thick yellowish liquid. Transfer what you got into a conical vial. Not a regular vial, but a conical one. We want the one with the little triangle at the bottom. After you're done pipetting it, cork it with a Teflon stopper. You're done for today. Bye.